was like right here. Hello humans, my name is Dale Kingsmill and we're here for part two of the story of Kilhuk and Olwen. Yes, that's right, we're covering a Welsh myth at the moment. It is a longer myth than I uh, think I remembered. So at the moment it's looking like uh, it may be split into three parts. Or possibly more. We'll find out as we go. But look, buckle in for right now because uh, because part two is a weird one. P.S. If you haven't seen part one of the story, you're gonna want to watch it so that you know all of this makes sense. So I'm gonna make sure that I've got uh, links to part one in all sorts of different places. The description. I'm gonna throw up a card in the top corner so that that way you can go and you can watch that one first, so that when you watch this one, you have any clue what's going on, because you're gonna need it. So a year passed with Kilhuk living in Arthur's court, and then finally uh, the messengers of King Arthur returned, and they brought no word of Olwen or her whereabouts. They still, they just couldn't find her. Kilhuk, of course, is very young, so he's a whiny little whiner about it, making a whole big deal about how everyone else got to have their hair cut food, why don't I get mine? Kai, who was a knight of Arthur with like a billion peculiarities as the author calls them, he could hold his breath and or go without sleep for nine days and nine nights, which is pretty cool. And he could grow as tall as a tree and any wound from his sword couldn't be healed. And his spirit was so fiery hot that it actually evaporated rain before it could land on him, so he was always dry even in the most inclement weather. Inclement's a good word. So Kai, with the superpowers, Kai stands up and he tells Kilhuk to stop being a brat, all right? We'll go with you then, and we won't leave your side until either we find the lady or you admit already that she doesn't exist. And Arthur thought this a splendid idea, so he called together an adventuring party. So we've got Kai, we've got Bedawir, who only had one hand, and he was one of the three fastest people in Great Britain. Including sword fight fast. He was like, fastest gun in the West, except uh, instead of a gun it was a sword, and instead of it being the West, it was like the West, as in, like, Great Britain, like, of Europe, the Western of Europe. And he also might have been in love with Kai? Question mark? Just saying? There was Kinthelig, the guide, who, as a ranger, had every terrain as his favoured terrain. Gurahir, whose name is uh, too long, so I'm only using his first one. He knew every language, every single one. Plus Gualchmai, who never went home until he had completed his quest. And of course, who could forget Manu, who is not the French-Australian celebrity chef, but rather he was the party illusionist wizard. So I mean ultimately the way that I see it, uh, they've got a paladin in Arthur, but uh, I, I don't think he goes with them, as far as I can tell. It's not super explicit, but I don't think he goes with them. A rogue druid, maybe, fighter, ranger, bard, wizard. Gwalchmai or Kilhuk could take that paladin role in Arthur's place. But I mean, Kai is clearly the party's face. It's pretty solid. It's pretty solid party makeup. I mean, they could use a cleric, but everyone could use a cleric. I mean, <laughs> Come on. Then, as the party sets off from Arthur's court, uh, things suddenly get a little bit labyrinthine vibe. At some point, you see, they come across uh, this field, this vast plain, and at the center of it is a castle, the most beautiful castle they've ever seen. Gorgeous, simply, mwah! But they have no idea who lives there, so they make their way toward it all that day, and by nighttime, when they feel like they should be arriving, they noticed that they're no closer to the castle. For three whole days they traveled and got nowhere, until finally something did change. As they traveled, they came upon a herdsman sitting on a mound. Beside him, a shaggy mastiff the size of a horse, even bigger possibly. I can only presume the dog's name was Hercules Morse. It only makes sense. The flock of sheep seemed as vast as the plain itself. Sheep, sheep, sheep without end, as far as the eye could see. Oh, and let's not forget that any time anything happened, the shepherd liked to deal harm to whatever was around. All the dead plant life around the area that he'd burnt to a crisp with his fire breath stood as testament to that, so. Hey, psst, hey, go to here. Go talk to him. What? No, no way, Kai. I only said I'd go as far as you would. I don't see you getting any closer. Oh, fine, we'll both go. It's all right, guys. I prepared a spell that'll stop the dog from attacking us. We got this. So up the three edge closer to the shepherd and engage in a dialogue that is apparently very witty in Welsh but just doesn't translate. But as far as content, uh, things get pretty weird here. I'd say hella weird and kinda dreamy. They talk to the herdsman and find out that his name is Kastenin. And would you know it, he's the brother of Uspathadden, 
the father of Olwen who they're on this quest for. Yeah, apparently Kastenen has been oppressed by his brother out of jealousy for like all the stuff he had or something. And then when they tell Kastenen that they're here to seek the hand of Olwen for Kelhuich, Kastenen suddenly goes from argumentative fire breathy guy to warning them not to do it. No one has ever come back from that quest alive, says Kastenen. Here's where the dreamy part comes in. Kastenen gets up, Kilhuch gives him a golden ring. The ring doesn't fit on his finger and so the herdsman puts it into one of the fingers of his glove. Herdsman goes home. Apparently the narrative follows him now. He gives the glove to his wife as a gift. Kastenen's wife pulls the ring from the glove and is like, where the hell did you get this? You can't afford this. You mind sheep all day. Kastenen lies for some reason, and I don't understand how the lie makes any sense. He says that he went to the ocean to fish, and he found a beautiful corpse bobbing along in the water. And that's where he says he got the ring from, from this pretty water corpse. Wife, she's not buying it. Fine, she says, show me the body. Not to worry, he'll be here for supper, says Kastenen. Mm -hmm. And just who is this beautiful walking corpse? Would you know it? That's the funniest part. It's your sister Galatha's kid. The uh, big pardon? Twist! Kastenen's wife is Kilhuish's aunt. Hearing that her nephew was come to seek the hand of Olwen, Kastenen's wife was both overjoyed and distraught, knowing that no one had ever come back from that quest alive. When the party arrives, she runs out to meet them and to wrap her arms tightly around her nephew. But at the last second, Kai snatched up a billet, like a, a piece of metal, and uh, wedged it between her arms, stopping them. Everyone watched in amazement as she squeezed so hard that it twisted the billet completely out of shape, like an unintentional Superman intimidation move. Dude, man, says Kai, that's, that's like evil love. Love. Could have been completely disfigured by that hug. But no harm, no foul, no one mentions it again, everyone goes inside and eats and does their own thing. Kilhuik's aunt at this point, who you'll note also doesn't have a name, she opens up a stone chest in the chimney corner and out climbs a son of hers? She says that she had three and twenty sons, all slain by Ispathaddon on the same quest that Kilhuk is on now. And she doesn't expect that this one will survive if he goes after Olwen either, so I take it that that's why she's keeping him in the box. But like, look, more importantly, lady, that is too many sons. Just, just stop. Stop. Kai says he'll take the kid on as a companion and promises that death will either take both of them or neither. Which is nice, but then they just kind of stop talking about it, like so many things. Instead, what they do talk about is why they're here. Please, says Auntie No Name. No one but us has seen you yet. Just go. Leave while you still can. Nope. Gotta see the fair lady Olwen to prove a point to kill Hook, says Kai. She ever come down here, out of the castle? Every Saturday, the aunt replies, she arrives here to wash her hair and always leaves all of her golden rings in the basin and never takes them back. Look, am I having a fever dream? right now. This is so weird. Just just so many things are floating in and out of relevance right now. The Knights of Arthur's Court ask Auntie No Name if she could so kindly summon Olwen to come and visit them here. And after they've promised not to hurt Olwen, Auntie No Name complies. So that's where we're gonna stop part two. Part three will be coming at some stage. And boy oh boy, it's gonna be a doozy. You won't wanna miss that one. If you enjoyed this video, you can show that in all the usual ways that YouTube enables. If you wanna see the next part of the story, you're probably gonna to wanna to subscribe so that you don't miss out on it. Uh, you can follow me on various social media. All my links are in the description below. Apart from that, I do believe that's it. I'm done. Email this to your grandma and I will see you some other time. I've got nothing witty to say. Nothing. I've let you down. I'm sorry. <laughs>